All chemical reactions occur more quickly when it's warm. And so if we store that carcass um, at a warmer temperature, that proteolysis will occur more quickly. We wouldn't really want to do that to a carcass. Hello folks, welcome back to the Meatspad podcast. I'm very excited because today we get to talk with a very, very well-known meat scientist. He's a professor in the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. We have Dr. Chris Calkins. He has a lot, a lot of experience uh, in meat quality. He's helped uh, small, very small, you know, large meat processors in his career. Uh, just very excited and it is a pleasure to have him on uh, today. How are you, Dr. Calkins? And uh, we're just uh, happy to have you on this episode. Very good. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you again for accepting the invitation uh, for being here today. Now, let's talk about you. Uh, I guess we have a lot, a lot to talk about today. But before we go into um, our conversation, please tell us more about you, your background. Well, you got a lot of experience in in academia and in helping meat processors and just helping the meat industry to understand more about meat science. Um, but please tell us a little bit about your background, please. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I love to talk to people and meat science is a passion that I have and, I, and so I love to share my passion. So thank you, Francisco, for making this a, a possibility. You know, when I was uh, born and raised in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, uh, and north of Seattle in the state of Washington. And uh, I had a wonderful high school uh, career and uh, involved in agriculture, had a really good high school ag teacher who became a lifetime mentor of mine. And uh, my senior year, I was really lucky. Through his mentorship, I was able to be elected president of the Washington State FFA. And so I sent my, spent a uh, hundred days of my senior year of high school traveling around, making speeches, talking about agriculture, encouraging students to develop leadership and contribute back to the discipline. In the, in the middle of that time, um, my mentor left and uh, went to graduate school in meat science at Texas A&M. My mentor, by the way, was Gordon Davis. Uh, a well-known meat scientist in his own right. And in fact, the meat laboratory at Texas Tech University now carries his name. So uh, a pretty good guy to hang your hat uh, with. Um, but, but Gordon came to me um, and, uh, and said, you should apply to come to school at Texas A&M University. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew it was an ag school uh, and it sounded good and it was 2,800 miles from home. So why not? Let's just jump in and take the ride. And so I went to Texas A&M for my undergraduate degree. The day I got to Texas, I was hired to work in the meat laboratory. And so I spent six months as the meat lab flunky doing everything from <laughs> salting hides in the Texas heat to cleaning the gut bins to, to being involved in animal slaughter and harvest and all the rest of that. And then a remarkable thing happened. The rest of my time at A&M, I was made an undergraduate research assistant. And so I helped all the graduate students do their research. And so by the time I got my bachelor's degree, I knew what graduate school was and I was interested in making my own contribution and being involved. And so uh, I went to uh, graduate school, started at Colorado State University. Uh, my uh, professor there took a job with USDA, so I moved to Tennessee, got a master's degree at University of Tennessee in food technology and science, and then back to A&M for a PhD. And then when I graduated in 1981, um, you know, 39 years ago, uh, uh, University of Nebraska had an awesome job. I wanted, I wanted to go someplace where beef was king, where I could be involved in undergraduate and graduate education, where I could conduct a research program, have control of a meat chemistry laboratory and a meat sensory lab, and uh, 
and that's what Nebraska had to offer, all of those things. And so uh, my wife and I came to Nebraska. Um, she's from Texas, so I uh, was a little nervous about going that far north, but uh, we had an agreement. We would give it two years and see how it goes. And so, as I mentioned, it's been 39 years, been a wonderful career and a great opportunity. So I love the discipline and that's how I got where I am now, Francisco. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I agree 100% with you, definitely being away from home, uh, from your own town, it's definitely being out of your comfort zone. And I, I think that's just help you uh, for just understanding more about other types of thinking, other cultures. I mean, away from even your own country, you know, a different country, understanding more about the agricultural production in that country. I think that helps you tremendously um, in the future. Now let's go back to our topic. Um, please tell us about, well, we can talk about many things uh, related to meat quality, but I think we had concerns from uh, meat processors just wanted to know more about what's going on after they harvest beef specifically. I guess we can talk about pork as well, but what happens after the animal is harvested? Uh, we can talk about that transformation from muscle to meat. Um, we can also talk about rigor mortis and how rigor mortis sets in. But I think this is this has a huge effect on on, on the overall quality of, of the product. But I think that's going to help just to to help uh, meat processors understand more about the topic. There there is a lot that goes on and. We think uh, my primary focus is meat quality, particularly eating quality. So taste, tenderness, flavor, those kind of things. And as you think about that, it's often easy to forget that those events that take place from the time we harvest the animal until we cut it up, fabricate it, uh, can have a pretty profound effect on the quality of the product. And so those folks that are involved in that process, I have massive respect for them. Uh, it's hard work, uh, but you actually have the quality of the product. You have control of that in your hands. So it's an important topic. Uh, biologically, that muscle goes through rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is another way of, of saying death stiffening, which is to say that when that muscle dies, it gets very rigid. Uh, we've all seen beef carcasses that look very firm, for example, but when we very first harvest that animal, the muscle is very soft and, and flaccid. And so that process of going from soft to rigid uh, is the rigor mortis process. In many ways, it is a slow, steady contraction of the muscle. You know, when we first harvest that animal, there's all kinds of energy in the muscle. So scientists like to call that ATP, but it's, it's energy that fuels the cell to do its work. And as long as we have that energy present, the muscle can stay soft and relaxed. But when we run out of energy, which eventually will happen, that's when the muscle becomes very rigid. Essentially what occurs is that muscle begins to contract and then we run out of energy and so it's locked in some level of contraction. That's rigor mortis. Now, from that point forward, we typically age meat, right? So that it becomes more tender after that. So that 18, 24 hours after harvest is about the toughest that meat will be we give time for the enzymes that are naturally occurring inside the meat to break down the protein and that will tenderize the product. So from the standpoint of meat quality, what we wanna do is minimize the contraction and then maximize that protein degradation that occurs as we age the meat. Great, Ray, that's a very interesting overview about what's going on. I think going back to your point, about how that can ultimately affect um, the overall quality, uh, specifically tenderness. Uh, could you please tell us about the relationship between time and temperature, especially because uh, I know some folks are interested in maybe just the effect of chilling and time 
um, and how can they optimize that to just help them for uh, the overall quality of the product? So that's uh, the first part of that has to do with the contraction side, right? And so when that muscle is going to rigor mortis and it's beginning that slow contraction, if we expose that muscle to extreme cold, it turns out we exaggerate the contraction. We get more contracted muscle. Therefore, we get less tender meat. Now, of course, from food safety standpoints, after we get done on the slaughter floor, we want to push that carcass into the cooler to make sure it begins the chilling process. I certainly would not want to disrupt that. But if that cooler is too cold, or if the, the wind speed is too high in there, uh, we can cause that muscle to cool too quickly, contract, and therefore become less tender. We call that process cold shortening. And it's just that, as the meat gets cold, it begins to shorten. Now there's some things we do uh, during production to help minimize that problem. Uh, for one thing we do is that we put subcutaneous fat on the animal. It acts like a nice coat so that when we push that carcass in the cooler, it slows down that rate of chilling. But a carcass that's very lean with almost no subcutaneous fat, the meat will chill too quickly and that cold shortening can occur. The other half of that equation then has to do with that aging or that tenderizing that occurs when we allow the product to hang or stay in refrigerated conditions for a period of time. And that reaction is also temperature controlled. Uh, most, uh, all chemical reactions occur more quickly when it's warm. And so if we store that carcass um, at a warmer temperature, that proteolysis will occur more quickly. We wouldn't really want to do that to a carcass. So the other strategy we use is we allow time. And as long as we have time for those uh, enzymes to break down the protein, then we're going to end up with a nice tender piece of meat at the end of that process. The aging process is unique for each different muscle, but a good rule of thumb is that 10 to 14 days or so of aging uh, before we freeze that product uh, would give time for that proteolysis, sure. or that tender, tenderization to happen and give our customers the best quality product that we can possibly deliver. Great, thank you. You pointed out very interesting things. Uh, and now, maybe we can talk about the importance of chilling. We talk about time and temperature, but how quickly can meat processors chill beef carcasses? Ideal chilling process would bring the temperature of the meat down. Of course, where you measure that temperature matters. If you're measuring just the surface of the loin, for example, that will chill out very quickly. If you're measuring the deep part of the round, that, that temperature process uh, drops a lot slower because we have to wait for that heat to dissipate through the muscle before it gets to the surface and then uh, the carcass actually chills. But typically we want to shoot for uh, having a nice, uh, relaxed, uh, uh, cool surface of the meat in 12 hours or so, we would expect the, the center of the, the muscle to in, in maybe 24 hours, could be about 40 degrees or so. Uh, and, uh, but if you're measuring temperature inside the round, that tends to stay a little bit warmer, takes a little longer to chill out. So oftentimes, uh, when we first put that carcass in the cooler, We'll hold it for a couple of days and really allow time for that rigor process to occur, for complete chilling to occur. Where we really have problems is when we try and accelerate that too quickly. I have literally been in coolers where the outside surface of the carcass is covered with ice, where we have a little moisture in there and the air is so cold and the breeze is so high that we almost freeze the surface of that meat. That's when we really have uh, severe conditions of cold shortening, therefore toughening the meat as well. So a nice steady temperature decline uh, is what we're shooting for and uh, too much too fast is what I'd try and avoid in simple terms. Great, thank you, Dr. Calkins. 
Now let's just talk about uh, a different topic. Well, it's related, uh, but we had a conversation with Dr. Phil Bass from the University of Idaho uh, a few months ago. Hey, we went over um, his research talking about heavier cattle. We saw that during the pandemic, some feedlot producers had to retain some of their cattle because uh, we saw that some meat processing facilities had to shut down or reduce their capacity. So therefore we see um, like a, an incidence of heavier cattle in the meat industry. And would you please tell us about the rate of chilling, especially those processors that may encounter heavier carcasses in their facilities, how can they counteract this or do they have to have a different rate of chilling or what's your recommendations or your take on this? The heavier cattle will take longer to chill, right? And so um, I'm not a big fan of saying, let's go turn the temperature down as a result. I, I think that if you've had success with your cooling process, I would just sustain that but recognize that those larger carcasses are gonna take longer to chill. And so waiting a period of time before you start cutting into that carcass would be my top recommendation in terms of these larger, heavier carcasses. Now, it, it is possible that um, inside the round and some of the, you know, where we have large muscle mass and a lot of time to uh, require to chill those, uh, that sometimes can create a problem where we need to look for ways to accelerate chilling just a little bit. But um, most of the time, the chilling capacity is sufficient in these smaller plants. And so uh, just stay the course, take a little longer time. And if you find what we're seeing in a, a lot of small plants right now is they're getting lots of animals. Uh, there's a big demand for their for their harvest services. And so as a result of that, it's possible to get so many carcasses in a small cooler that the refrigeration cannot keep up. And certainly in that kind of situation, you need to turn the air down a bit and keep the air, or try and keep the overall uh, room temperature uh, cold uh, without heating up too much due to the, just the mass of animals that you're putting into the cooler. Cool, thank you. This is a very interesting topic. And I guess especially in the future, we'll be translating some of these episodes uh, to Spanish. So for folks in Latin America can understand more about also the, how can they improve and optimize meat quality. Especially these folks, sometimes they tend to have a leaner cattle when it comes to the subcutaneous fat. And that's just uh, the inherent differences between um, the production that we have in the US and Canada with a grain fed finish um, versus maybe those folks in the South may have a more linear cattle, um, different genetics. Could you please tell us this relationship, if they may have a linear cattle, less subcutaneous fat, uh, how, can, how can they um, understand this topic? How can they relate it when it comes to the rate of chilling? Can they use the same rate of chilling that we have, or that we use here in the US? or just please tell us more about this. Great question. For those people that are producing or dealing with animals that are very lean, uh, then a more gentle chilling process is definitely called for. And uh, uh, we also see there are a few other strategies that you can use to optimize tenderness of those animals. Um, uh, sometimes we see smaller plants will use the hip suspension uh, which will tend to stretch the muscles and minimize that contraction that takes place. So that tender stretch process offers some opportunities as well. I have been in some plants outside the US where they actually separate the round so that it's opened up and therefore you get a little more uniform chilling. Uh, that's not a bad way for chilling, uh, but we recognize whenever you start removing carcass connections, it allows those muscles to shorten. So you have to be a little strategic in how you do that. But certainly I would say if you routinely deal with animals that only have a few millimeters of fat, then uh, you could probably slow down the chilling rate just a little bit. And uh, the, I the idea is that I would still shoot and expect that 
after about 24 hours that you have the rigor proc process complete. Uh, the animal, the pH has reached its ultimate level and um, that the muscle is firm and solid. And in those cases, uh, you're fine. Usually if you get severe chilling, in addition to the shortening, we also see a very coarse, dark band on the outside of the ribeye uh, when we separate between 12th and 13th rib to look at that ribeye surface. And so if you see that dark, coarse band, that's indicative of the fact that that region of the muscle uh, was chilled out too quickly. And so those are some visual indicators you can do without getting too complicated and having to go out and buy a pH meter and run a lot of chemical tests and the rest yeah. of that. Uh, they would be in good indicators of the, whether you have a, a chilling process that is too severe or not. Thank you. I'm sure they, they will appreciate this information. Uh, and now, um, this is more like a personal question for you. You know, you have a lot of years of experience. And I think we, we try to ask these questions to our guests. Uh, will you please tell us uh, about a certain experience that uh, you've gone through um, during I mean, your uh, experience as, as, a, as a meat scientist? And maybe you can point out one experience that really helped you um, to just become a better professional, had a huge influence um, on you as a professional. You know, you spend a lifetime doing this, there's a, a whole lot of choices I could give for this answer. But there's really, I think, two things that I would highlight. Number one, as I began, uh, as a high school student, I graduated from high school, I drove 2,800 miles to a new location, and I, did, I knew one person in the entire state of Texas when I arrived. And so that challenge of having to move locations gave me the, well, it required that I really figured out quickly who I was, what kind of person was I going to be? Was I gonna have a positive attitude? Was I gonna kind of be sour or bitter? Well, was I gonna be optimistic? Um, was I gonna be honest and open to meeting new people? And I think that that process gave me, uh, taught me that I really need to be um, open and willing to listen. And that leads me to the other half of this. Uh, we have gotten some attention from our muscle profiling research, uh, which helped identify the flat iron steak among others. And I will tell you that even though uh, people talk, use my name and they talk about University of Nebraska, that was a joint project. It was cooperative. We cooperated, uh, cooperated with Dr. Dwayne Johnson at University of Florida and worked with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Bucky Gortney helped lead that project. And if I learned anything, it's there is tremendous power in collaboration and cooperation. When you get to where you don't worry about who gets the credit and you have a group that wants to come together and make the work happen, wow. There, there are so many things that can occur and there's plenty of recognition that can go around and it's a win-win for everybody. And so I would say, be open to working with new people. Frankly, be open to all kinds of new experiences. You know, the skills we use today are different than the skills I needed when I first started my career. Things keep changing, right? And so be open to adding new tools to your toolbox because you never know which one of those you're gonna need uh, as the next phase of your life moves forward. So I wish everybody the best. This has been uh, great fun and I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. Thank you, Dr. Calkins, for your time. Again, I appreciate uh, your support on this initiative and um, I hope to see you soon in, in some conference that I know we're gonna happen at some point. Thank you.